Welcome back to our series called There's Power in the Blood. So far we've looked at the idea of blood being used as a cleansing agent and then the idea of um, people having wise blood, people who have overcome diseases and then sharing those uh, antibodies with others. Uh, today we're going to have a look at the idea of transfusion. So by way of introduction, for the greater part of medical history, humans have believed that letting blood out rather than putting it in was the best way to treat illnesses. But as time moved on, people were more open to the idea of uh, sharing blood, if you like. It was thought that blood contained humours and various other vital essences. Uh, it was even suggested by one doctor that to commingle the blood of quarrelling spouses may help them to get on better. Not sure about that. It wasn't until the 19th century, really, that some real successes were first seen with this idea of transfusing or sharing blood between, uh, particularly in some cases where women ha had had traumatic childbirth and childbirths and were losing a lot of blood and um, transfusions were given with some success. Um, in, a, in the book that I read recently, there was an account of a medical missionary doctor who I already mentioned yesterday, and he went to India in the 50s to work with people there. And on one occasion, there was a 12 year old girl that was brought in with a serious lung condition uh, and the doctor spoke to her family, who were all there, and informed them that the surgery she needed would require th three pints of blood. The hospital only had one pint of blood, so a family member would need to, to donate the rest so that the surgery could go ahead. Now, the elders of the family, who were strong men in their prime, discussed the matter, and after much arguing, they refused to donate their blood. After further discussion within their family, they pushed forward an elderly woman who weighed about 95 pounds and said that they could take the blood from her. The doctor fixed his stare on the plump men in, the pro in their prime and he lost his patience. Berating the men, pointing his finger at them, he rolled up his own sleeve and he got the other surgeon in the hospital and said, I'm not going to risk this girl's life because these men are too cowardly and selfish to help her. Take my blood for the surgery. As the cuff was fastened, and the red blood began to flow through the tube into the bottle. The men watched in awe and proclaimed, Look, the doctor is giving his life for the girl. Eventually, they were able to overcome their fear and superstition, and they were persuaded that it is not life-threatening, life and in fact that it was a noble thing to do. So they then went on to roll up their own sleeves and provide the rest of the amount required for the surgery. On another occasion in the book, the doctor in India tells of a girl who he thought had already died through bloodless, blood loss. Her skin was cold and grey, almost translucent, and the life had gone from her face. It seemed that there was no hope. He said that he would never forget the miraculous sight of perfect resurrection as a blood transfusion was given, and as the blood was pumped into her and the colour returned to her face, she revived and recovered as though back from the dead. There's scarcely a better image, is there, that we could come up with of one person giving another person life than to literally see the lifeblood flowing out of the veins of one, one person into another. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we were dead in our sins and transgressions before we, were, before we came to Christ. And the same chapter goes on to say that now we've been made alive with Christ. As Jesus instituted the, Lord, the Lord's Supper, he proclaimed, this is my blood shed for you. As we partake in the Lord's Supper, we remind ourselves that we have moved from death into life because Jesus was willing to give his life for us.